Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing, and today we're starting a brand new series in which we'll explore the history and development of quinch opera, which is one of the most popular forms of traditional opera in China today. Quinch opera can trace its origins back to the late Ming Dynasty and a small town south of the Yangtze called Quinshan. In some quarters, quinch opera is regarded as the ancestor of all opera in China. It has even been described as one of the three sources of world opera. Quinch opera, as also said, has at one time or another embraced every influence imaginable, from music and dance to poetry and the world of the spirit and even the very soul of the Chinese nation. All of which makes it hard to imagine that there was a time when quinch opera. Completely disappeared. Many great nations in the world have their own performance arts that are regarded as being of refined taste, and these are often used to express national spirit and various related sentiments. The Greeks have tragedy, the Italians have opera, Russians have ballet, and the British have the plays of Shakespeare. These performance forms and famous works are a source of pride in their respective nations. But what are the forms of performance that express the refined taste of the Chinese nation? Today, with the camera, we place on record the entertainment forms of our time. But what did the ancestors of today's Chinese watch and listen to hundreds of years ago? Can we probe their spiritual world? It is February 2006. And the China National Museum is holding a special exhibition, but the main part is not the 2,000-odd rare cultural relics, as impressive as they are. The chief exhibits are intangible items that were once part of life in ancient China, and which have survived the times and recent periods of great social change. As such, they are part of what UNESCO has designated the oral and intangible cultural heritage of mankind. Six years ago, UNESCO was selecting the first batch of oral works to be formally designated part of the world's intangible cultural heritage. To the surprise of many people, selected for inclusion by unanimous vote was Kunchu Opera, a traditional opera form from China. With this decision from 2001, Kunchu Opera, a form that had been in oblivion for many years, began to attract increasing numbers of theatre goers. In the winter of 2004, an entirely new version of the Kunchu Opera, The Palace of Eternal Life, was staged in Beijing by the Suzhou Kunchu Opera Troupe. The troupe spent nearly eight million yuan on rehearsing the work, 
and engage the services of Oscar-winning art designer Jimmy Yip. Scholarly businessman Chen Chi Du from Taiwan invested heavily in this show, and considerable assistance was provided by recognized Kuenchu opera artists. Before 2001, however, such an event would not have been possible. A new version of the opera Peach Blossom Fan is being rehearsed by the Jiangsu Provincial Kuenchu Opera Troupe, with a cast composed of many top artists from China, Japan, and South Korea. The director is Tian Qinxin, a woman who is an up-and-coming director of stage plays in China. The playwright who adapted the work named it Peach Blossom Fan 1699. As part of an approach that would attempt to portray an historical event in a way that would draw ordinary theatergoers into a dreamy atmosphere of the ancient past. When Bai Xianyong took his new version of Peony Pavilion to the United States in 2006, each of the 12 performances of the work on the West Coast played to a full house. American theatergoers praised the production as incredibly refined and beautiful, with one theater critic comparing its sensational effect to that caused by Mei Lanfang's performance tour of the U.S. in 1930. People cannot help but ask why it is in the 21st century that Kuenchu opera, this very ancient theatrical form, still possesses such great charm. The question is, what is it that has made Kuenchu opera what it is today? Looked at another way, how has it changed in the course of the past 600 years, and what is it about Kuenchu opera that has allowed it to survive all this time? Suzhou in South China is a city with a history of 2,500 years. Kunchu Opera took its initial form in the area of Kunshan in present-day Suzhou municipality more than 600 years ago. Shantang Street in the city of Suzhou was developed during the Tang Dynasty, and for more than 1,000 years, it has been a showcase of the city's prosperity. There is an old Chinese saying that speaks of the great beauty of the city of Suzhou. There's paradise in heaven, and there's Suzhou and Hangzhou on earth. As the lifestyle of Suzhou residents went beyond the imagination of the majority of ordinary Chinese, they compared Suzhou to paradise. In the middle and late periods of the Ming Dynasty, Suzhou became the largest metropolis in southeast China. Transportation was well developed, commerce flourished, and at the time, the city was even more prosperous than the two national capitals, Beijing and Nanjing. The price of land in Suzhou was higher than anywhere else in the country. The city provided one tenth of the national revenue in the form of grain and taxes, and almost all the daily necessities demanded by the royal family. Suzhou set the level. For the nation's highest standard of living. Ming Tao Zhongye 之后呢，沿着中国的这个长江中下游，那么跟啊大运河这么一个十，我时常说这个十字架构，还有中国这个东南沿海呢，经济发展的很快啊。那么经济发展的很快呢，社会也发生了变化，所以这个商品经济的。这个蓬勃呢，使得商人阶层，换句话就是说是，跟商业有关的一般人，不再只是士大夫阶层，他整个非常的蓬勃起来。这个造就了许多民间的艺术。
跟上层的精英的艺术跟文化有一个交流，上下的交流啊。这个交流的最有趣的这个场域啊，就是戏剧。The most fashionable pastime in the Suzhou of the time was watching Kunshu opera and playing a role in the Kunshu opera performance. During Mid Autumn Festival, an annual Kunshu opera fair was held at Huqiao Hill, and at this time, the whole city of Suzhou would be turned into a sea of celebration. The Kuenchu Opera Fair at Huqiao Hill epitomized the popularity of Kuenchu Opera in China under the rule of the Ming and Qing dynasties. The melodious melodies that originated in this area south of the Yangtze River were carried to the Imperial Palace and even to frontier towns in the provinces of Yunnan and Guangxi. During the Ming Dynasty in the 1600s, an Italian missionary by the name of Matteo Ricci came to China. At this time, Europe was rising rapidly, but China was still the richest country in the world. To the eyes of Matteo Ricci, the Chinese Empire had everything necessary for the life and happiness of its people: food and clothing, ingenious gadgets, and luxury goods. Matteo Ricci was surprised by the attitude the Chinese had toward wealth. As he saw it, vast wealth had not nurtured in the Chinese an ambition for territorial expansion and conquest of other countries. They behaved politely, were well educated, and knew how to enjoy life. They had refined almost every detail in life so that every facet was imbued with an artistic quality. In his notes about China, Ricci wrote, "People in this nation love opera very much. Many young people are involved in opera performance. Opera troops travel all over the country to put on performances for the public or individual families. People hire these opera troops to perform at grand banquets, in which the guests eat and watch the performance at the same time. Such banquets often last more than a dozen hours, and the performance goes on until the end of the banquet." The form of entertainment Matteo Ricci is referring to is Kunshu opera. He felt, for himself, the ardent love the Chinese people had for this form of dramatic art. Matteo Ricci was from Italy, the nation where Western style opera originated. At a time when Western style opera was gaining popularity in Italy, Kunshu opera had already entered its golden age, almost 200 years earlier. Than the time when Italian opera reached its zenith. 